with Mark being gone, of course, he's been teaching through Revela- Revelation. Um, like Jarrett, who te- taught a couple of weeks ago, he said, I'm not going to teach on Revelation. We're going to leave that to Mark. But uh, I've got a uh, supplemental lesson today on what do you do until the second coming, until what Revelation uh, describes will happen. What is our responsibility from now until then? And so this is a lesson from Second Peter chapter 3, verses 11 through 18 on the coming of the Lord. But before we get to that, uh, as was said in the 8 o'clock service, I am a proud father of a graduate. It's uh, good news. My daughter, my oldest, Ashley, graduated from uh, Stephen F. Austin with an agriculture degree. There's more good news. She's been interviewing uh, this whole semester, January through to now, and recently accepted a position as uh, inside sales for Prefert, which is a farm supply company in Mount Pleasant. And uh, that's what she wants to do. She has an agriculture degree, and she wants to uh, build better beef. That's her thing. So through nutrition, through uh, genetics, uh, other stuff that she wants to build better beef. And so I'm glad she's my daughter. She might be able to give me some free steaks uh, as... (laughs) We move along in life. So I'm, I'm supporting her and encouraging her as she goes. So, so we're happy for the graduates. Number two, there is a happy mother. Uh, that's my wife, Holly. Someone, we ran into someone, uh, it, was, it was on Wednesday night, and, they, and we were talking to him at a restaurant, and they said, oh, wait, is this your wife? <laughs> We've never seen her before because we're never together at church, uh, hardly ever. And so uh, anyway... Uh, Holly, to Holly, I wish a happy Mother's Day, and for uh, a happy mom, we waited seven years to have our children, so they were, and it was a two for one because they're twins, even though you might be asking why the other one is not graduating. It's because Ashley graduated a year early. She took um, dual credit classes, summer school, I terms. She tried to get it all in because she wanted to get out of school and get into the workforce. I thought, good. <laughs> Some of you have full-time students as kids, and that's killing you financially. <laughs> this kid moved out a, a year early, and so um, her sister will graduate on time next year. So we'll celebrate them separately, because that's the thing with twins. You're supposed to do everything together, which I'm a little upset that now I have to go to two graduations for college. That's not, was it not, not in the plan. Uh, I even asked Morgan, my younger, and they're twins, so they're like 30 seconds apart. She's the younger one. I asked Morgan, could, could you go ahead and have the graduation party with your sister this year and just get that taken care of? That was not acceptable. They, they're loving having this separate, and uh, I, can, I can get on board as well. So that's, that's, all, that's all good. So here is, that's her sister, that's her twin sister, and uh, she'll graduate uh, next year. And so we're excited. So that's just a little uh, beginning for our class And I'll use it as some illustrations as we're moving along here as we look at Peter's letter to the church. A couple of uh, introductory things for Peter. He wrote this letter between 64 and 67 AD. So if you do the math, when did Jesus leave the earth? When did he die? He was resurrected and then he ascended to the Father in what year? Come on, you're the biblical literacy class. Tell me. Around 33. Some of, you are just, some of you are just thinking, we don't know exactly. You're right. But around 33. So you got about 30 years after is when this letter was written. So that should give you some context as to what Peter is saying. Because when Jesus left, what did he say? I'm coming back to get you. You know, the disciples are thinking, okay, we got maybe a few months, a few weeks. We better get everything ready. We'll sell everything, uh, give it away to everyone because who cares? We don't need it. Jesus is coming back. And then, you know, a year later, they're thinking what? Can I get some of that stuff back? (laughs) Turns out Jesus is going to be coming back a little later than we thought. So so they're waiting. And now several years have passed. Now Peter is uh, getting older. He's in jail. He knows the end is coming. And he's knowing he needs to get some letters out to encourage his fan base, to encourage those who are called according to the purposes of God, to make sure that they understand what's happening since Jesus has not yet come back. His message needed to be carried on to further generations. And he had an important message, and that's what we're going to look at today. So this is what the purpose of his message was, graduation. What is graduation? 
It is the end of one term, and then you're turning the new page into the next term. So Ashley, leaving school and tests and papers, now she'll go into the workforce. She starts in June. We'll move her into Mount Pleasant uh, in an apartment, which is only like walking distance from where she's going to be working. It's kind of a small town mentality, and she loves that. But uh, she's ready to get to work. She's ready. And I'm I'm so happy for that company because they've got someone who loves to work, is a hard worker, and she's ready to go. She's not just wanting to to hang out. But she's turning the page into a new area of life. She has a new focus. And that's what we're talking about here. That's, That's for all of us. When we graduate from one part of life and move on to the next part, one big graduation is when you are born again. That's a graduation from your old life into your new life. And like for some students, it'll take you a while to get to understand this new workforce or adulting, as the kids call it now, to understand how that works and what needs to be done in order to be a good adult and be a good citizen, not just of America, but of the kingdom of God. So after graduation comes the learning process and you, you, you learn and grow. So what is the last graduation The last graduation that you will ever have is when you leave this earth through whatever means necessary to move you on to heaven. And when you get there, then all the learning is finished. That's the final, the ultimate final exam. But before that, it's the last graduation. So we're all looking forward to that last graduation. And until then, though, are we just going to hang out on the couch and fail tests and not go to class? No, you still go to class. You take your test. You do well. So you get ready and you're able to graduate. You want to graduate well. So that's what Peter is talking about here. Graduation, not only of himself, because he's in jail. He knows that uh, his end is coming and he wants to get this message out. The second thing is Peter is talking about the end of the world where the earth is going to graduate on and no longer be. And so that's kind of his attention getter. So if someone says to you, hey, the world's about to end, uh, you need to get with the program, you're probably a little more interested uh, and focus on that because that's motivation right there. The, The end is coming. We know for sure. We just don't know when. So in chapter one of, of 2 Peter, if I said 1 Peter, I meant 2 Peter the whole time. I uh, hope the video editors go back and edit second each time I said first, if I did that. But we're in 2 Peter, uh, but just kind of to bring us up to chapter 3, where we're going to be, chapter 1, Peter talks about remembering. Let's see if I can remember how to do this. So here... He says, uh, this is now the second letter that I'm writing to you. So it's Second Peter compared to First Peter. And he's talking to his beloved. In both letters, though, he says, I'm stirring you up. I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. Peter and Paul both say this a lot, that they want to stir your mind up by reminder. And isn't that what graduation is about? Because when you're, when you're getting to graduation, what's the thing you do before you go graduate? You take your final exams, or you might have a final paper or a presentation or a, a defense of your paper or, or your, your master's or doctoral. Um, you have to do this final test. And so you're, you're studying, and the test is requiring you to do what? Remember what you learned, hopefully through the whole year. If you were like me, you only studied the review stuff. I mean, I didn't really learn anything. I just learned how to memorize stuff long enough to take a test and then get by. And so I did that well. I just, you know, didn't learn anything. <clears throat> well, the, the point is, Peter wants you to remember what you've been taught. And so he's going to stir you up by reminder. And that's what our whole lives are. While you're here on earth, until you get to the graduation, you are constantly either being reminded or remembering what it is you're supposed to do. Because like when you're living the Christian life and you're, you're going along and you're, you think you're doing fine, and then someone will share something with you, or maybe you hear a sermon or a, a great teacher will teach you something in class, like Mark Lanier. And when that happens, you're like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Because we get, kind of get focused in different areas, don't we? So we need to be reminded of what it is we're supposed to do. And either you say, yeah, I remember that, I got that. Or, ah, I totally, I totally missed that. I forgot about that. I need to focus on that a little bit more. And so that's what we hope today is. Um, so he wants to remind you of several things. One is your calling. Peter says here in the, the first part, the first chapter of Second Peter, he says, I want you 
to, to make sure you're, you're called by God, to make sure that you are in the faith. Peter and Paul both talk about this, even though as pastors we don't preach on this very often, that we constantly want to ask you and, and for ourselves to be reminded whether or not you are saved. Make sure you're in the faith. And you say, well, is it possible to, to think you're in the faith and not be? Is that possible? Yes. Even Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't even do what I say, Matthew 7. Um, you, you call me Lord, you think I'm your Lord, but you're not following me. And by definition, if he's the Lord, what do you have to do? What he says. That's exactly right. If you don't do what he says and you just call him Lord, that is hypocrisy. Uh, Isaiah calls it lip service. You're just going along to get along. And, and maybe it's a show for everybody else. But down deep inside, God knows you're not following him because you're not doing what he said. So just take a minute and look at your life and ask yourself that question. Am I just calling him Lord or is he my Lord? Ask yourself that question. Where are you in the continuum of obedience? Remember your calling. He also wants you to remember the promises, the, the precious promises. Peter calls them the precious promises. He says they came from the prophets. They came from, uh, these, they came from Jesus. They came from the apostles, of which Peter is, of, of the teaching. And these are things that are going to come true. Remember what they are. Remember what they say to do. Remember what they say your hope is in because you have a responsibility. That's why you need to remember and then some, there are some qualities you need to have in your life. Not just things you need to do, but things that as your life, you need to exhibit those things. So Peter reminded uh, them of those things as well. Um, on Saturday, I got up in the morning uh, to go, I'm sorry, yeah, Saturday, uh, to, to get up and run some errands to get ready. And I go out and my tire is flat on my car. And so I had to uh, call all the deacons of the church to come and change my flat. <laughs> No one was available. I'm like, I, I can change the tire. I've not changed the tire in a really long time. So I open up the back and get all the stuff out. And I'm like, oh, there is something missing because the little thing that, you know, cranks the thing to make it go up didn't have that. So I called, I did call a friend and I was like, hey, I think I'm missing something. But anyway, he's like, nope. Uh, I told him what I had there. He said, you got everything you need. You just got to put it together the right way. I needed to remember how to change a flat tire since it's been so long. I needed to be reminded. So I... Uh, Got it all figured out, and I got that thing cranked up. It was great. Got the lug nuts off. That was easy. Uh, had to use an adapter. You know, all these intricate things that were needed to change a flat tire. I was, it took me a minute because I hadn't done it in a while, but I was able to remember. I had friends and giving me encouragement over the phone, and I was able to take care of the situation. So when I finished, uh, I'm going to finish. There it is. When I finished, I put the spare on, and I lowered it down, and guess what? The spare was flat. That's a, that's a double whammy. When, when the, the thing to come in to fix your problem can't fix your problem, that, that's rough. But when, when I took the, the spare out of my trunk, it looked fine. It felt fine. But when I put it on the car and I lowered it back down and the, the weight and the pressure of my car came up on that tire, it revealed what? It didn't have what it took. It was not ready. It was lacking. And then therefore I was lacking. Uh, discount tire is only two miles from my house. And so I, I figured there was enough air in that spare um, to get me there. And it did. So I, I limped on in and then the professionals, they took care of uh, everything and I got a new spare. So now I'm prepared for a real flat tire on the highway in case um, someone shoots my tires out or, or whatever. Because rem y'all remember I had a drive-by shooting at my house. So I'm very aware of gunfire around my property. So this reminded me, as the Christian's life, um, I thought I had everything that I needed in case there was a problem. And I'm just driving along life and everything's fine until the pressure came and I had to make a change. I found out after the fact that I was ill-prepared. I was not ready for the uh, flat tire because my spare was flat. So as Peter here, he's reminding us, and this is the reason, sometimes you find out when it's too late that you're not ready. So you need to check to make sure your spare has air in it. So I guess all of you, when you go home today, you're going to all go to your trunks or underneath your SUVs, and you're going to make sure that tire... Are you? Probably not. <laughs> but if you just look at it, it looks fine. You know what I'm saying? It looks good. How would you know? 
either you'd have to put it on your car, or you can get one of those little gauges. Have you ever seen those? You know, you put it on there, and psh, shows you how much pressure's in there. That's an easy way to find out. Um, in fact, my father-in-law, Ed Etheridge, he said he has them check his spare every time they rotate his tires to make sure it has air pressure in it, which that's easy for them to do. They're checking all the other tires. They check that one and make sure. That's a good plan, because what is he doing? He's being ready. He's being reminded, and he is reminded that he needs to be ready. So anyway, all this to say that what Peter is talking about is important for us today. So we take this little sabbatical from what Mark is talking about in Revelation to make sure we're ready for the day of Revelation, what the day of Revelation will reveal. So in uh, 1 Peter, um, 2 Peter 1, this is some of the stuff that he talked about to be reminded of. Listen to this. He says, supplements of your faith. He says, supplement your faith with this, virtue. Yes, bless you. <laughs> Blessings and virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, which just means sticking to it, even when it's like rough to, you know, you're not in the mood to change your tire, you still got to do it. Godliness, brotherly affection, and finally, the special word agape, which means love. It's a sacrificial love. He says, if these qualities are yours, and they are increasing, which indicates that they're not just stagnant, but they're growing, that you're becoming better and better at these, as an example, these characteristics that Peter listed for us. They keep you from being ineffective or blind. In fact, Peter says here, he says, you become so nearsighted, you forget about what God's done for you in your past. So that's why I want to stir you up by reminder. And so I'm on Peter's role here, I want to stir you up by reminder. So he says, number one, remember the truth. Number two, avoid the false. He says, there's going to be false teachers that are coming. They're going to lead you astray. You need to be studied up and prepared. You need to remember the things that you have learned so that if a false teacher comes, you're going to be able to do what? Discern whether or not this is true or not true. Um, I have a friend who works in the secret service He's uh, assigned to the Dallas office. And do you all know one of the other responsibilities of the Secret Service, other than protecting important politicians, do you know what else they do? They're in charge of currency. So any kind of, uh, what's it called? Oh, counterfeit. Any kind of counterfeit cases, they investigate and prosecute through the uh, Secret Service. And so he was telling me that in order to be a good Secret Service agent in regard to currency, the way that they make sure they're always aware of what's going on is they try to find out every counterfeiter's ploy, and they study them intricately to know everything that counterfeiter might do. So if the counterfeiter does do it, and they try to pass off a bill, and they're investigating it, they can quickly realize that that's a counterfeit bill. Does that make sense? The only problem with that is, if you're not aware of every scheme that the counterfeiter uses, you might miss one, wouldn't you? So the truth is, he said, we never look at all the schemes. I mean, we're aware of them. But he said, what we really do is that we focus in on the real currency. We know everything about the real currency. We know all the safety measures, all the things that would keep someone from counterfeiting. We know where every, everything is and the things that you don't even know are there. We know are there so that if a counterfeit bill was passed, we could do what? Quickly realize that it's a fake. It's not real. So my friends, the way that we understand a counterfeit faith is to know the true faith so well, forwards, backwards, sideways. We come to church every Sunday. We come to church every Wednesday. We, we study our uh, Bible every morning. We get up and we read or at night before we go to bed. We listen to Mark Lanier's video, Thought for the Day. But you know why? Because the thoughts that he's sharing are the things of God and what God is teaching him in his life. And isn't that inspiring? And, and so, as a result, we should be able to know our faith so well, and, and increasingly doing that, that we would be able to recognize a false teaching in a heartbeat. And even if we're not 100% sure, at least it'll throw up a red flag. We can talk to some friends about it, and we can find out if this is something we need to pursue or something to avoid. Because Peter is very clear as he introduces, he says, Stay away from the false teachers, for it would have been better... For them, if they had never even known the way of righteousness, because they've taken it and they've, they've 
uh, built it down. They, they've, they're destroying the faith by teaching false things. It's better if they weren't even saved in the first place because now they've taken the truth and they're bringing others, leading others astray. And that's really something that he wants to avoid. The third thing in the introduction is that Peter's trying to keep us reminded. He's trying to keep us to know the truth, avoid the false. And he says why the motivation for doing it is because time is running out. How many of you have a a healthy understanding of time and know that you're not going to be here forever? How many of you think you're going to live forever and uh, all is well? There we go. I see a couple of hands. These are the younger people who are like, uh, y'all are worried too much. Life, there's plenty of it ahead of us. We got plenty of time to do. But the older we get, the more and more we realize that time is fleeting and it's, it's, it's going to be over sooner or later. Peter was very aware of this. Not only was he in jail uh, and was being persecuted, uh, he was also being prosecuted and he knew his time was coming to an end. So he had kind of a a hurried rush now to get these letters out, to say the things he wanted to say, to leave the legacy that he wanted to leave. How many of you are going to leave a legacy when you leave this earth? How many of you? Who's not leaving a legacy? Who's already decided, I'm not, I don't want anyone to know anything about me. I'm not going to leave a legacy. Anybody? Good, because you know what? Whether you like it or not, you will leave a legacy. There is something about your life that someone's going to know, whether it's a good legacy or if it's a bad legacy, you are definitely leaving a legacy. Don't you want to leave a good legacy? At the very least, you want to leave a good word for the things of God to those who are coming after you. That if anything else, or I should say, if nothing else that they could say about you, at the very least, they should be able to say, well, you know, grandma, granddad, mom, dad, Joe, Sally, Phil, They did a lot of stupid things. They had a lot of harebrained schemes. They did a lot of funny things. They took good care of me. They didn't take good care of me. But of all those things, they did love the Lord. And that could be said by someone who doesn't even believe in the Lord. Like, I don't know why you're such a fool. You you believe in the things of God. I don't understand why you waste your time going to church and doing all these things. But I have to say, at least I know that that you, you believe that. Because you're doing the things that a Christian would do. You're doing the things that you've been taught to do. And you're, you're not being a hypocrite. Unless you are being a hypocrite. And then that's the legacy you're living. Hey, let's start building our legacy today, right? No matter how old you are or how young you are. That you want to make sure. Not, don't just assume. You want to make sure that those who are coming after you know where you stand. You're like, well, I, I don't want to drive them away. From what? (laughs) If they're already away from the Lord, you can't drive them away. Well, they may not ever come. That's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to have them, give them that opportunity. At least they know what you believe. We need to be very obvious about our legacy that we're leaving. And so uh, we need to find ways for doing that. And here's the motivation, because the day of the Lord is at hand. Have you all heard of that? The day of the Lord? Have you ever heard this song? This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad in it and be glad in it. Hit the key change. Take it to the chorus. Okay, no. That's okay. You don't have to. Some of you, thank you for playing. (laughs) Yeah, it's that old verse. And it comes from Matthew uh, 118. It says, I will praise you for you have answered me and have become my salvation. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the context of that saying and song of this is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. It's not talking about today. You understand that? This is not the day of the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. They were not talking about that particular day, and nor were they talking about you saying it today. Now, did God make today? And we're still going to rejoice and be glad in it? So it's okay to say. But in context, it was the day of salvation. And this was a prophecy looking forward to the day of salvation, the day of the Lord. And when was that? When Jesus Christ died on the cross. That was the day. That was the day of salvation, and that was the day of the Lord. And that's what the psalmist here is saying. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in that day because that's the day I received my salvation. They didn't even have it, and yet they considered themselves having it because they were looking forward to the promise of God that he would send his son Jesus to pay the penalty for our sin. That is the day of salvation. 
And the, the psalmist said, it's not even here yet, but I rejoice in that day because that's the day salvation will come to me. So now we look at it after the cross, there is another coming of the Lord. He's coming again, right? For us, that is the day of the Lord. That is the next day of the Lord. Are you rejoicing today in anticipating that day? Now, if you're not living right and you're not following the rules and the principles and the policies, not to be saved, but in order to enjoy your salvation, if you're not doing those things, the day of the Lord's not going to be a great day. If you say, I'm going to rejoice and be glad. Today is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. You're talking about the coming day of the Lord when this day ends. How many of you are really ready for that day? Some of you are like, very quickly. Some of you had to think about it for a second. After thinking about it, you thought, okay, well, I'm almost ready. <laughs> There's like five things I still want to do before that day. You better do them today because guess what? You don't know if he's coming back or if you're just leaving the rest of us. I, we don't know. But uh, he says, Lord, you're coming back. Maranatha, Lord, save. It's the coming day of the Lord. Uh, 2 Peter 3, he says, But the day of the Lord will be like a thief in the night. Uh, it says, in, in the heaven will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and this, all the works in the earth that will be done on it will be exposed. I'm trying to read my dark handwriting there. So, Mark has been talking about Revelation. Today, we're taking a supplemental course just on are we ready for that day that uh, Mark's been uh, delineating how that will all happen. So, number one, in 2 Peter 3, we're looking at verse 11. First thing, that we need to live godly lives. So, in the interim between now and what Mark's talking about that will happen in Revelation when God comes back the second time, we need to li live godly lives. He says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved... He's talking about all the things of the world. What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Isn't that a great question? And he's asked that just right out. What sort of people ought you to be? I mean, it's great to come in here and hear all these lessons and check your boxes, but are you being a different person as a result of, of what you're hearing? Waiting for and hastening the coming day of God. While you're waiting for and hastening, what does that mean, to hasten something? What does it mean to hasten something? To hurry it up, make it happen faster. I talked about my daughter who graduated and then her twin who's going to graduate on time. What did Ashley do? She hastened the day of her graduation just by hanging out and hoping it would work out. Nope. She took those dual credit classes. She went to summer school twice over in different summers. She took the intensive I terms. She was planning. She knew how many hours she needed. She was making the effort to be ready because she wanted to hasten the day of graduation. That doesn't mean if you don't that you're a bad person. <coughs> Excuse me. But the idea here is that if everyone gets saved, then that's what God's waiting on for everyone to be able to hear the gospel at least and to know the truth before he comes back. If we're out living godly lives and sharing the gospel, what's it going to do? It will hasten the day of the Lord. And that's what Peter's talking about here. He says, while we're waiting for that coming day of the Lord, we're waiting on it, and hopefully you're hastening the day of the Lord. Put that in your vocabulary. That's something that you should be doing while we're still on this earth. Hurrying up the day of the Lord by doing the right thing, God's going to take care of the rest for the coming day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. Talk about global warming. <laughs> so anyone who says to you, do you believe in global warming? What are you going to say? Absolutely. I'm glad you asked. I'd love to sit down and talk about the coming day of the Lord. See how that conversation just turned spiritual? All of a sudden you went from political to spiritual in that one phrase, and you're doing exactly what you, those of you who believe, are supposed to be doing. Turns in those conversations constantly to the things of God. Um, my wife and I were over here at that Ambriza Mexican restaurant, which is in the, the vintage uh, a few days ago, and I got there before her, so I was getting our table, and so I was standing there at the front with the hostess, and she knew that my wife was coming. We were waiting. She had to pick up the phone. She was answering the phone. There was a couple that were walking out, and I looked at them, and I just said, hey, was your meal good? And I'm thinking, you know, that they're going to 
you say the place is a good place to eat or, or not. Was your food good? And they said, oh, yeah, it was so great. I said, uh, would you eat here again? Definitely, definitely. He was, well, go tell your friends, okay? Oh, okay. So they, they, they walked on outside the door. And I, I told the hostess, I said, they think I'm a manager here. <laughs> But they walked out and lingered. <clears throat> Next thing you know, my wife came in, and so uh, and the hostess was ready to take us out to the patio. And so we ran back into this couple, and the lady looked at me, and she said, do you own this place? <laughs> so I thought about it. I almost said, yes, I do. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not the owner. She goes, well, are you a manager? And I said, no, ma'am, I'm really not a manager. And she goes, you just work here then. I said, no, I'm a customer just like you. And she said, well, I, I thought, don't, you look familiar. Do I know you from somewhere? And I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> Do you? She said, Do you go to Champion Forest Baptist Church? I said, well, yes. She goes, you're in that biblical literacy class, aren't you, with Mark Lanier? And I said, okay, you found me out. <laughs> I said, yes, that's, that's how you know me. She said, I thought you looked familiar. Uh, I thought maybe that you were the owner because of the questions you were asked. I said, yeah, I kind of led you to believe that. I, I get that. Next thing you know, we're talking about the things of the Lord, what's going on in their lives. My wife had come up. We're having this great conversation on the patio. And why? Because I started a conversation and God changed it to spiritual things. That's what we need to be doing. We need to be taking every opportunity, remembering the day of the Lord's coming. My day might be today. It might be later on. I might have a heart attack after eating that uh, fajita or whatever. So let's go ahead and share the gospel before we eat then wait till after. Does that make sense? Shouldn't, shouldn't we? Because global warming's coming. Hopefully we'll take advantage of the opportunities to share. Okay. Oops. Yep. Okay. So we're talking about living godly lives in verse uh, 13. Uh, but according to his promise, which he calls precious promises, we are waiting for the new heaven and the or new earth in which righteousness dwells. So that's what we're waiting for. We know we want that. Are we being busy about doing the things we need to getting up to that point? Therefore, therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for all these things, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Be diligent to be found holy, doing the right thing, and at peace. I know Mark's not here today because every time he's here, there is a bottle of water. Like, you guys bring him all the water, and then I get up here, and I'm parched. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, I'll push on. So, second thing, number two, is live gospel lives. Oh, my goodness, praise the Lord. <laughs> See that? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Hang on a second. You've just met my needs. Thank you very much. Thank you. The day the Lord's coming, you have done well while you're waiting. I appreciate that. What, see, I just did that as an illustration. <clears throat> So we need to live godly lives. The second thing, we need to live gospel lives. And we've already kind of stretched on this a little bit. But moving on to verse 15. And count the patience of the Lord as salvation. Amen. If he wasn't patient before you got saved, if he came before you got saved, it would be too late for you. But his patience is salvation. So let's not get frustrated that the day of the Lord is not yet come but we know that it's coming and we want to hasten it. We want to be living gospel lives by sharing the things of the gospel. Just as our beloved brother Paul, so this is Peter, the apostle Peter, talking about Paul and his ministry. He says, just as our beloved brother Paul, who wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all of his letters, when he speaks in them of these matters. Now, I went to Rome back in 2019 and uh, saw the prison that Peter was in and probably the one that Paul might have been in there with him. This was a prison they might have shared uh, time together, maybe. We don't know for sure. We know they were both imprisoned in Rome. And uh, it's a horrible existence in a Roman prison. I don't know if any of y'all, any of y'all have been there? Have any of you been to an American prison? I see that hand. You know, just kidding. No one raised their hand. <clears throat> it's okay if you have been. That's okay. That's not a problem. Um, but Peter definitely knew who Paul was. 
and was referring to him. He was, he was giving him props, encouraging him. You're reading this letter. Have you read some of Paul's letters? Get them if you can, because the things that God revealed to him, he's trying to reveal to you so that you can be ready to live your life appropriately while we're here. In other words, go to church, study your Bible, take advantage of the opportunity that we have, and then, of course, take action. He says, moving on, there are some things in those letters that Paul wrote that are hard to understand. Even Peter was like, man, this guy... <laughs> which the ignorant and the unstable, uh, unstable twist to their own destruction as they do other scriptures. So I wanted to look at a couple of things that, that Paul said. Here in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. There's a contrast between folly and foolishness and power. Folly is uh, weakness, unable to, to take care of what needs to be done compared to the power, the power that God gives us. You're equipped by the power of God to get the things done that you need to do because a lot of you are thinking, yeah, I, I would love to do more for God. I'm just not equipped to do it. God is here to equip you. He's still here by the Spirit to give you the power in order to accomplish His ways. When I met up that, with that couple at Ambriza, if I'm saying that restaurant correctly, I wasn't thinking I'm going to be witnessing or, or encouraging someone in the things of the Lord. I just started a conversation, and God made that change. I didn't have to do it. I really didn't have to think about it. I just had to take action when the conversation changed to continue on the conversation and not just to let it go. So that's what Paul is talking about to remind us as well. Paul goes on to talk about the Jews demand signs. The Greeks, uh, they seek for wisdom you know, from philosophers. But we preach Christ crucified, which is a stumbling block to the Jews. It's folly to the Gentiles. But to those of us who are called, those of us who are saved, both Jews and, and Greeks alike who are being saved, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And that's what Paul wanted the believers to, to remember. And then Paul talks about salvation. He says, for I delivered to you... As of first importance, what I also received, what, that Christ died for our sins in accordance to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. So Paul didn't just tell the story. He emphasized where he got it from and the emphasis that God's Scriptures are the ones that are revealing this to us. It's not just me trying to tell you what I feel and what I think, but what I've learned from the Scriptures. I worked harder, Paul says, than any of the other apostles, which Peter's telling us about this. Uh, Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me, whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Do you believe that? If you take the opportunity to turn that conversation spiritual, will you trust God to be able to give you the words in order to say what you need to say? You might stumble around a little bit. I stumble around while I'm teaching sometimes. But you may stumble around, but at least you're getting the truth out. So the real question is, are you studying the truth? Are you being prepared? After Mark teaches a class, do you go back and watch it on the internet so that you can make sure you get those things, maybe make a couple of notes? These are great talking points. When you leave class on Sunday, Mark Lanier gives you so many great talking points that would fill up a conversation with someone who's already a Christian or maybe someone thinking about being a Christian. You should take advantage and make some notes and some talking points so when you're out there and the conversation changes, you can be like, hang on a second, <laughs> or run to the bathroom. <clears throat> I got a note here. Okay, the third and final thing we were talking about, to be prepared while we're still on this earth before the end comes, before the coming day of the Lord, live growing lives, constantly growing in the things of faith. Sounds like all these points talk about themselves. Uh, seems like I've been talking about all these different things in every single point. So hopefully you're getting this. Uh, last point, you therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people, and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory and honor both now and for the day and eternity, the, um, the day of eternity. Amen. So it's a little benediction at the end that he gives praise to God, reminding them you need to be studying the things of the Lord and you need to be worshiping the Lord. Is that a good word? It's easy for us to worship, isn't it? Isn't it fun to come to church and let somebody else tell you what song to sing? 
Isn't it fun to come to church and <clears throat> talk so much that you lose your voice? <clears throat> Thank you. I, I don't have a drinking problem, <laughs> obviously. So the, this, this idea is we're growing in godliness that, that we're, we're worshiping the Lord, but even through that, that we're, we're learning of him, and we're, we're eager to learn. Uh, another thing my father-in-law, Ed Etheridge, he, he would say a lot, used to, is people would drive hundreds of miles to go hear a concert, but you wouldn't walk across the street to hear a sermon. You get what we're saying, even though you can learn a lot through music, and that can teach you. In fact, a lot of the scriptures that I learned are by songs that I learned when I was a kid, that I can still remember those scriptures because of the song. So I'm thankful for music. But am I eager to hear about the things of the Lord, to sit? Maybe I'm tired and it's been a crazy day, but to still go ahead and do the things that I'm committed to do and learn of him. Maybe you get up in the morning and you're like, oh, I don't feel like reading. And you go ahead and read, and then that reading does, does what? Inspires you. It excites you. Or you're like, I don't know why I did this. This was stupid. That was kind of a dumb scripture. Oops, do I supposed to say that? But then later on in the day, you realize that that scripture was preparing you for what was going to happen that you didn't even know. Maybe you get a flat tire. <laughs> and maybe the scripture is a little bit of encouragement that God is sovereign and in control. And even with a flat tire, he still wants to teach you. But God, I've got a lot of stuff I need to do. Could you have done it another day for the flat tire? And God says, I have it for you today. Learn of me. Stop and take the time. So everything can teach us about the things of the Lord. If you're living a growing life, then you're going to be learning and growing Hopefully, you're going to live a gospel life. You're going to be able to teach the things of the Lord. He, um, 2 Peter 1.17, For when Jesus received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the, majest, uh, by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Who said that? <clears throat> Who was he speaking of? Why was he so happy with Jesus? <clears throat> because he knew the truth. He was going to be speaking the truth. If you've ever read John chapter 17, which is God, Jesus' prayer to, to the Father, we call it the high priestly prayer, Jesus says what? Father, I have done everything you've commanded me to do. I have not done anything you didn't tell me to do. I've done everything you told me to do. I've avoided doing everything that you didn't say to do. I only wanted to do the things you told me to do, and I did them to your glory. I did them, and I, and I put your name up first. And now you're glorifying the Son. So this is the end of Jesus' ministry. You have the beginning. The Father says, this is my beloved Son. Listen to him. Pay attention to him. He has the truth. He says that to us. Pay attention to this person. This is a person who's been studying and learning and growing of me, taking advantage of the opportunities. Listen to them and go and spread the gospel. Go and say the good news. If we do what Jesus did... God says, I am happy with what you're doing. Well done, good and faithful servant. So this would be Mark's points for home as we close out. Things that you need to do before the end, all right? So if you didn't already get this, here it is for you. Number one, live right. Live godly lives based on God's word, based on uh, the things that you've been taught by your traditions. If they're good traditions, that's great. But live right. Make it a point to get up every day putting your feet on the ground, saying, God, I'm yours today. I said it yesterday. I'm going to say it again tomorrow. I'm yours today. I don't know what you have for me, a flat tire uh, conversation at the restaurant, um, a, a boss that dresses me down for something that was stupid and makes me really think about um, humility and, and being a humble person. I, I don't know what you have in store for me, but I'm going to learn from everything. I'm not going to get frustrated even though it might be frustrating, I'm going to learn of you through all these things because I want to turn the conversation around and teach somebody else. So live right. Share Jesus with everybody. Take every opportunity. Don't be ashamed to say the name Jesus Christ. And let them know that Jesus is the reason that you live the way that you live. Unless you're living bad, then tell them Lucifer is the one that you're following. <laughs> <clears throat> But if Jesus is the one that is filling you up and empowering you, even if you're not perfect, let, let everyone know, you know why I do this? It's because I have a heavenly Father who loved me and forgave me, and that's why I'm forgiving you. That's why I'm loving you. Uh, that's why I'm helping you change your flat tire, because God helped me. Where were you on, on Friday when I had my flat tire? 
So live right, share Jesus, take every opportunity, and then keep, keep growing. So just as we close, I want to list out this list of qualities that Peter did at, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. Just as a reminder, he says, on the foundation that you already have, because these are followers of Jesus, on the foundation that you already have, he says, bring these qualities in, uh, supplement, add to the faith. That's what he says. Supplement these things to your life to make sure you're doing these things. So there's a lot of lists in the Bible. This is just one of them. I want to leave you with this list because you can't focus on everything today. Let's just focus on this list from 2 Peter chapter 1, 5 through 7. Build on faith, virtue, or excellence. And on that, he says, build knowledge. And on your knowledge, build self-control. Yeah, he says control yourself. Stop doing the dumb things. Start doing the smart things. Have self-control. On that, build perseverance. Once you have self-control, keep doing that. Be persevere, 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 even in the difficult times. On that perseverance, he says, build godliness. Be like God. It's very easy to say, hard to do. On that, build brotherly affection. That means love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Find a way to see what their need is and give them a help. And don't get frustrated when they, they don't do what you say. Forgive and move on. But be that constant in their life. Persevere with brotherly affection as you love one another. And then finally, he says, God's sacrificial love. Be love. Be agape to people. Uh, love them. That's not just your brothers. That's everyone. Love everyone with sacrifice. And that's kind of hard to do. So the end of the world is coming. Are you ready I uh, hope for today was a good reminder, opportunity to know some things that we are responsible to do before Revelation hits, okay? You can recognize the signs of Revelation by what Mark's been teaching. You know the end is coming and a third of the earth's going to be destroyed and uh, this and that and the other thing. That's an indication that it's almost too late. Today, there, there's no storm. There's no horrible situation. Well, there's a lot of horrible situations. But right now, you're able to get up. You're able to get to church. You're able to get around. Take advantage of this opportunity because one day you won't be able to. And you're going to wish that you had done more. You have a little bit of regret maybe. But let's not even think about that. Right now, let's just think about what are we doing today? Today, you're going to honor your mothers. And again, to you, happy Mother's Day. For those of you who are mothers, for those of you who are not and desire to be mothers, Pastor Jarrett, uh, if you hadn't heard him, he will say a great welcome even to those who uh, are not mothers and maybe who want to be because I said my wife and I, we were seven years wanting to be mothers where Mother's Day was one of the hardest days of the year. Um, others of you, your mothers have passed on. So now these Mother's Days are more difficult. Uh, others of you have your mothers here. You're a mother. Life seems great. And you're just celebrating today. That's great. Celebrate today. But everyone's going to be in a different place. So as the man of God, I want to I wanna meet you where you are. And I hope you want to do that with each other. Don't just assume. Let's find out where we are in ways that we can minister love and grace. And don't assume just because I, I, I'm okay that you're okay. I'm not going to assume that. And just because I say, how are you doing? And you say, I'm fine. That doesn't mean that you are. And it doesn't mean you want to share with me everything here at church. But I want you to know that I'm interested in you. And I want you to know that a week later, when you have my phone number, you can give me a call. We can talk about it then. And you can do that amongst each other. That's why we have our fellowship groups in this class. Are you a part of a fellowship group? Are you? Are you a part of a fellowship group? Does your group meet? Hopefully. Because we want to help you engage in in, in uh community and relationships. And if, if you don't have a, a fellowship group here, you probably have one somewhere else with your friends and family, but have those, invite people in and have the opportunity to do what we need to do until the end comes. And in the meantime, Maranatha, Lord save. Our Heavenly Father, as we close out today, we're always thankful for your goodness to us. We're thankful for your patience. And in your patience, salvation can come to so many others. And we don't know where they are, but we might be conversation number seven out of 25 that they'll have before they finally become saved. I pray that you would help us to be faithful, to have conversation number seven and not skip it and make someone else have to have it, that we are ready to serve you because the end is near. I pray that we are motivated by that. I know that's what you use to motivate your disciples. I pray that we're motivated that global warming is coming, and until it does, 
We only, only have a little bit of time. So we always look forward to what you have in store for us because we know that you love us and you set the example. Help us to follow you well. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.